All right, modernism. Modernism, again, uh, lecture one, second, um, second take. I hope that some of you know about the French Revolution. Um, I hope that some of you know that what, what the Magna Carta is. Um, these two things, they seem like really kind of almost distant, the distant past, even to 1850, uh, are really big deals for modernism and specifically the trajectory that is mapped by Western art historians, myself being one of them. Um, so the Magna Carta in Britain was, uh, what that did is it established basically a human bill of rights. It gave people within the British Empire, which w at that point was incredibly vast, it gave them a very small amount of privileges and rights, and also duties according to those rights and privileges. Um, I say it gave all people, but I really specifically mean it gave all white men privileges and rights. If you were a woman, if you were a person of color, if you were not a landowner, your rights were drastically diminished. But um, you still had uh, humanity. You still and and what the Magna Carta did is it kind of like solidified the sense of uh, of human rights. That um, and so that happened a hundred years before the French Revolution. The French Revolution was one of the first m massive topplings of, uh, of, of a leader by the people. And so you have individual citizens that rally together and overthrow their government. And they do this historically on the heels of the Magna Carta. The Magna Carta gave people in the British Empire rights, people in the French Empire saw their rights were being slowly diminished and basically were being treated like slaves for the royal class and so they revolted and they revolted to pronounce their sense of individuality it is not surprising that after the magna carta and after the french revolution that artists begin to privilege the idea of individuality that's not really that surprising and i hope that that makes sense to you you know after seeing all of this tumultuous political stuff developing and hearing about it in history classes, they realized that, like the, revol the revolutionary citizen, they could also pronounce themselves as being individual and slightly radical. And so a lot of the paintings we're going to be looking at in today's lecture deal with a radical approach to making paintings one that is reinforced by the individuality and the individual decision-making of the artist at hand. Um, now, uh, yeah, so, that's that. I've taken the, pic the little video off because it can be a slight distraction from looking at some of these slides. So, um, here we have Theodore Jericho's Jericho, there's a T at the end that you can't really see because of the, the, the scope of this viewfinder. Um, this is called, this painting is called The Raft of the Medusa, and it is from 1819. Um, so this is fairly new to revolutionary France, or post-revolutionary France. This is one of the first big paintings to come out around the end of that revolution. Or not around the end because the end was in the 1780s um, but you know near to it now what this painting uh, encapsulates is a true life story of a ship that was um, destroyed in a storm and a raft of people that were uh, they were survivors of this shipwreck but when um, when the, these survivors were found by another ship um, they, a lot of the people on the raft were, had already died. Some of the people who were on the raft had resorted to, um, uh, they weren't necessarily cannibalizing any of the other people on the raft, but things were getting near to that point. Um, for whatever reason, humanity likes to, especially our culture, likes to privilege stories where people eat each other, um, like the daughter party or that, uh, 
that movie Alive where the soccer team crashes in the Andes. Um, this didn't happen. This wasn't that dramatic. But for French society, this was insanely dramatic because these people were adrift for a lot of days. And it was this big, ver it was a, there was a political fallout to the way that the French government handled the saving of these people and the looking for this shipwrecked um, vessel. And so what Jericho is doing and why this painting is regarded as being revolutionary is he made a painting about a real life event. He made a painting about a news story. This wasn't a painting about some fictive world where um, people, where everything is beautiful and pristine and mathematically precise. This is about the messy, gross shit of a world that uh, the revolutionary, the post-revolutionary French were dealing with. Um, and so he, you know, there's a lot of standardized things about this work that make it very interesting, and for historians, it makes it makes it quote unquote good. Um, those things have to do with the motion of the canvas. I mean, you can see the tumultuous seawater in the back rising and falling with this very large wave on uh, what is your left hand side, and kind of de diminishing into. Um, a slightly smaller wave in the background on the right hand side. The entire orientation of this uh, happens in kind of an X where on the right hand side you have these people that are trying very hard to get the attention of a distant ship, one that is actually in the painting that you can't see, and then the mast that they have rescued from their sunken vessel in order to propel themselves through these rough seas. And so you have this, this structure that failed them, and then the people. And those are the two axes that this painting deals with. This orthogonal or diagonal uh, mast here that runs down and kind of highlights this corner of the raft, um, dead bodies included. And then you have this billowing, um, please save us, blanket, and all of these people using what strength they have left to propel this person up higher so that a ship that's way off in the background back here can be can see them. And then it, it kind of swoops down like this uh, and again leads us to dead people. The dead people was a big thing for Jericho. He wanted to show the world that this was the kind of stuff that was happening in the world. This placated um, uh, Republican, and I say Republican in in this old French way, where the, there are people who were in supporting the Republic of France. They were um, uh, those are the people that wanted to see this kind of truth. Um, you know, now we use the terms Republican and Democrat to mean two very different things. But uh, the French Republic, the Republican in the French sense in 1819, had to do with uh, those who were privileging the Republic over the um, the imperial excuse me I'm, I'm I, as you can probably tell I'm a little under the weather but I will push forward Eugene Delacroix uh, liberty leading the people from 1830 Eugene Delacroix is a hugely influential painter for the people that we're going to be talking about in the next two sections of this lecture uh, he was one of the leaders of the Ecole de Beaux Arts which was the leading art school in France, which because of the French position in the global art world, it was the best art school in the world. The Academy, the Ecole, which is the French word for school, de Beaux Arts. And Beaux Arts is this kind of antiquated sense of what the arts are. And those privileged painting, sculpture, and architecture. Delacroix was the leader of the academy when a lot of these people that would later be referred to as Impressionists were in art school. They knew who he was, they saw all of his paintings, he was very, very famous, and they liked him a lot because he was telling a different kind of story. He picked up the torch of realism from uh, Jericho, who was his instructor, and here you have uh, this quasi-fictive scene where you actually have people of the French society that are rising up and they're being led by this allegorical character and we're going to talk about allegory later on but this allegorical figure of liberty who is seen with 
French flag in one hand, bayonet in the other. Um, you might be wondering, you know, why is the, this one lone female figure um, bare-chested in this painting? That's specifically done to indicate that she is not of this world. Any woman, even a revolutionary woman, would have covered herself up in preparation for any kind of social engagement, whether that be going to tea at someone's house or fighting an army. This, the fact that we can see her chest, her bare chest, has to do with the fact that this is supposed to be read as an inspirational spirit or an inspirational guide for the revolt. And you can see uh, in the you know in this picture you have very well dressed men with top hats and he's got a gun but you also have people of color that are joining the the fray um, young children also joining the fray this was a fight that people got around France at this time is kind of I like to equate it to Egypt of our day where it's this country that is very very volatile but it's not just like an oppressive government and um, revolting people it's this conversation between the the people that want a just government and this government that wants to just to to, to run and to essentially exploit some people uh, and so there's this ebb and flow back and forth between the people and who they're fighting against so Delacroix massively important guy this painting is one of the most important paintings in modern art history um, and you can see this kind of blushy paint uh, that he applies here. I mean, this back here, these clouds, um, but even the way he renders some of these bodies, this is supposed to be a very messy, a very chaotic scene. Delacroix is referred to often as a romantic with a capital R, as in his pictures are very... Uh, dramatic. They have this heightened sense of drama, and it's that heightened sense of drama that is equatable to the idea of the romantic. Here we have uh, the other leader of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts during the, revol um, the Impressionist development, um, which is a guy named J.A.D. Ang, or Jean-Auguste Dominique Ange. Um, I-N-G-R-E-S in French is pronounced on like A-N-G and this is this very precise portrait that he did of Napoleon on his imperial throne to, so I'm giving you this picture um, it, there's obviously no slide identification stuff because you don't need to know it for any exam or quiz but I'm giving it to you to show that this guy had allegiances with the powers that be this is why he was not favored by these radicalized young artists that would later be referred to as the Impressionists. This is the picture that I want you to know of Jean-Auguste Dominique Ang. Um, and it's called the Grand Odalisque, and it's from 1815, so it's the earliest picture that I'm showing you. Um, there's lots of ways that I can talk about this, but one of the things I want you to take uh, a real hard look at is the proportions of this woman. Ang, um, you know, he is regarded as a, a neoclassical a neoclassical artist, i.e. he is looking at the mathematic perfection of classical Greece and, and Roman art, classical Grecian and Roman art, excuse me, um, and he is reinventing it for modern society. And so here he is giving us this very classic idea of an odalisque, which is basically a reclining female nude. That's what that word means. Um, and uh, But this odalisque is rendered in this very, very precise way of painting. But the one thing about this precision is that it's not biologically correct. You can see the, the length of this woman's back the disproportionate uh, width and uh, like mass of her lower, or the lower part of her body to this very dainty upper part of her body, almost a tiny head resting along on top of a very grand body. He's added some vertebrae in there. Um, you know, he's extended her body to make her seem more elongated, more elegant, more perfect. So he is not necessarily realism, quote unquote, 
He's going for a kind of perfection. Next are the people that are going to revolt against this kind of perfection.